Let's uh, turn again to the Gospel of Mark, this time to chapter 15, and read uh, from verse 42 of this chapter. And we're going to read then into chapter 16 and to uh, the end of uh, that chapter. So Mark 15, verse 42. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honourable counsellor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marvelled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it, of the centurion he gave the body to Joseph. And he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulchre which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulchre. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. And when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall I cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the, sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. May the Lord bless to us uh, his own holy and inspired word. Brethren, this morning uh, we're going to be considering the seventh verse of Mark 16. But go your way, uh, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him, as he said unto you. Jesus had risen from the dead. This was the astounding news that the angels had revealed to the women that attended at the sepulchre of Joseph of Arimathea on the Sunday morning following Jesus' crucifixion two days earlier. The women had come early to the sepulchre. These were the women who had ministered to Jesus during the course of his earthly ministry. 
They had followed him throughout Judea, providing for his physical care as he ministered the word and as he performed his miracles. These same women had been at Calvary the previous Friday and they had witnessed his crucifixion. Taking the different gospel accounts together, it's possible to identify some of the women that made up this group. There was Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. There was also Mary, the mother of James and John, the wife of Zebedee. And there was also Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus had cast seven dev devils. In addition to those women, there was also Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Early that Sunday morning, at the rising of the sun, as Mark describes it, these women uh, were among a larger body of women that made their way to the sepulchre of Joseph of Arimathea. Their purpose was to complete the preparation of the body of Jesus for burial. This was reflective of their deep love and abiding devotion uh, to Jesus. They administered to his physical needs during his life and they were intent on doing the same in his death. The preparation of his body for burial had been curtailed the previous Friday uh, due to the proximity of the Jewish Sabbath. As they made their way uh, to the sepulchre this Sunday morning, it occurred to them that the great stone that sealed the entrance of the sepulchre would need to be rolled back. So they asked who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre. Uh, clearly the women were not anticipating the resurrection. They need not have worried about the stone. As they approached the sepulchre, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away. Upon entering the sepulchre, they found a young man clothed in a long white garment. This young man was an angel, as we discover from the other gospel accounts. The women were frightened by his presence. Recognising their fear, the angel speaks words of comfort to them. He says to them, be not affrighted. You see Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified, he is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. The grave clothes were there, but the body of Jesus was gone. The angel charged the women with this task. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, as he said unto you. Not only were the women to see and believe the glorious truth concerning Jesus' resurrection, they also must convey that truth to his disciples. Go your way, tell his disciples. But not only his disciples in general needed to hear that word, but notice what our text says. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter. Mark, whose knowledge of these events came from Peter, preserves for us that exquisite and heartwarming detail. Yes, go and tell his disciples, but be sure, be sure also to tell Peter. Tell them what? Tell them the great news. Tell them the news upon which every believer's salvation depends. Tell them that Jesus is risen from the dead. Tell them that Jesus, their crucified Lord, goes before them into Galilee and that there they shall see him as he said unto them. And so we're going to look at this word of God this morning, brethren, under just the uh, short uh, theme or title, And Peter, And Peter. We're going to divide the sermon under these three headings. Firstly, a word of reminder. Secondly, a word of love. And then finally, a word of comfort. The message conveyed by the angel to the women at the sepulchre was a, was a word designed to bring certain things to the remembrance of both the women and the other disciples to whom 
the message that they were given was to be conveyed. Now that's obvious from the last part of the message delivered by the angel to the women at the sepulchre. Notice what we read. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him. Then note this, as he said unto you. Shortly before his betrayal by Judas Iscariot, Jesus had told his disciples that he would go before them into Galilee. On the previous Thursday night, uh, Jesus had celebrated the Passover with his disciples for the last time in the upper room in Jerusalem. Following the uh, Passover meal, Jesus and his disciples, save for Judas Iscariot, had gone to the Mount of Olives where Jesus had told his disciples plainly that he was about to die. But not only would he die, but he also informed them that he would also rise again from the dead. Quoting from the prophecy of Zechariah, this is what Jesus declared to his disciples as recorded in Mark 14 and verses 27-28. There he says to them, All ye shall be offended, or all ye shall be stumbled because of me this night. For, it, for, uh, for it, it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And then notice this, but after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Now following that revelation, a revelation that in, in many respects the disciples themselves uh, did not really uh, take to heart, but following that revelation, you might recall from our reading in Mark 14 that Peter began to vehemently protest against what Jesus had said, uh, while at the same time pledging his undying loyalty and faithfulness to him. So that we read in verse 29 of uh, Mark 14, where Peter says, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. In response to Peter's pledge of undying loyalty, uh, we find recorded in Luke chapter 22, a parallel passage, Luke 22, verses 31-32, that Jesus issued this warning to Peter. He said to him, Simon, Simon, and when he uses the term Simon, he's referring to him as Simon, flesh and bud, not Peter, uh, the rock of grace, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter doesn't uh, really hear that warning. He's not phased by that warning. On account of his brashness and self-confidence, uh, Peter didn't heed the warning. Instead, he began to boast, so that we read in uh, Matthew's uh, parallel account in chapter 26 that Peter says, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Furthermore, Peter goes on to say, as it's recorded in Luke 22, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death extraordinary self-confidence. In those statements, Peter exalted himself. Indeed, he exalted himself above his fellow disciples. The import of his statements was that although the other disciples may abandon you, although the other disciples uh, may not remain faithful, yet I will never do that. I will always stand by you. Jesus' response to Peter's self-confidence recorded in Mark 14 and verse 13 was withering. Verily I say unto thee that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Before the following morning, Peter would deny Jesus Christ. 
And he would deny him not once, not twice, but three times. Three times he would disown his Lord and Master. But even that warning failed to dent Peter's self-confidence. He remained supremely confident that under no circumstances whatsoever would he ever deny his Lord. So that we read in Mark 14, verse 31, But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. By virtue of his supreme self-confidence, Peter set himself apart uh, from the other disciples. And although the other disciples echoed similar expressions of loyalty, nonetheless, Peter stood out from all the rest. He was the one that boldly proclaimed his unshakable allegiance to Jesus Christ. Others may deny him. The other disciples might deny him. But Peter says, not I. Not I. However, as Mark's gospel sadly reveals, Peter's confidence was greatly misplaced. His confidence was grounded in himself. He relied upon his own strength, upon his own steadfastness. And so consequently, Peter was an easy mark for Satan. As Jesus said to him in the garden of Gethsemane, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that was certainly true so far as Peter was concerned. Because only a few hours later, that same evening, Jesus, having been betrayed by Judas Iscariot, uh, Peter uh, was there at the premises of Caiaphas, the high priest, which is where Jesus had been taken. Mark, in fact, informs us that initially Peter followed after Jesus was taken from Gethsemane. Mark informs us that Peter followed afar off. Why afar off? The answer was fear, fear for his personal safety. Peter followed Jesus to the high priest's house, but John, in his account, informs us that Peter did not immediately attempt to enter into the courtyard of the high priest, but rather he stood near the door. Eventually, Peter, with the assistance of John, gained access uh, to the courtyard. And there he warmed himself uh, by the fire with the servants of the high priest, and with the assembled crowd. And while there, a young maid of the high priest saw Peter, and she simply said to him, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. And that girl's statement caused Peter's courage to fail. His response was sharp and emphatic. I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. He denied that he was one of Jesus' disciples. Furthermore, he denied that he actually knew Jesus. In fact, Peter feigned a lack of understanding as to why such a thing should even be suggested. And then only a short while later, another servant girl saw Peter and she declared, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. This time, Peter's denial was even more emphatic He declared unequivocally, I do not know the man. That's recorded in Matthew 26. I do not know the man. Peter's loyalty to Jesus was rapidly unravelling. And then not long after, another servant declared, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. This was too much for Peter. We read in Mark 14, 71, But Peter began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And what we see there is that Peter actually swore an oath. 
He called upon God to bear witness to the truth of what he was saying. He swore by the name of God that he did not know Jesus and that he was not one of his disciples. And immediately the cock crew. It was then that Jesus' words struck home to Peter. Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. The man who had boldly declared only hours before, I will never deny thee. Though all men deny thee, yet will I never deny thee, had done just that. The man who had so confidently asserted, I will never deny you, now said, I know not the man. Peter's self-confidence and all his boasting lay in tatters. In the hour of his Lord's humiliating trial, in the time of his Lord's greatest need, he had forsaken him. It openly denied him, not once, not twice, but three times. There was no escaping the fact that Peter's denials were sinful, shameful, cowardly. It's worth noting that his denials were not made uh, before the presence of the high priest or before any of the Jewish religious leaders, nor were they made to the Roman soldiers, but his denials were made in response to questions or assertions from servants. They were made following simple queries from young girls. None of his denials were coerced from him. They were not made as a result of threats of harm. But Peter's denials were effectively unsolicited. And they began with the very first query regarding Peter's relationship to Jesus of Nazareth. The very first query elicits his first denial. And in his denials, Peter distinguished himself again from the other disciples. He'd done that firstly, as I've mentioned, through his proud boasting. Uh, but now he did it also by means of his shameful threefold denial of his Lord. Denials, the essence of which were that he was not nor ever had been a disciple of Jesus Christ. He did not know the man. He had no knowledge of this man. Jesus of Nazareth was nothing to him. These denials, of course, issued from the mouth of the same man that had previously declared of Jesus thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It also said of him, Lord, to whom else shall we go? Thou thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. How fickle. From the time of Peter's threefold denial, events moved quickly. The Sanhedrin was convened, a mock trial was conducted, false evidence was adduced, Jesus was convicted, he was condemned to death, approval for his crucifixion was sought and eventually obtained from Pilate, he was taken to Calvary and there around 9am on the same day he had been arrested, he was crucified, nailed uh, to the cross. And six hours later, around three in the afternoon, having committed his spirit into the hands of his father, uh, Jesus laid down his life in death. We read in Matthew 26, uh, And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of of Zebedee's children. Later that same afternoon, 
Jesus' body was removed from the cross by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. His body was wrapped in linen bandages and laid in Joseph's sepulchre. In light of the impending Jewish Sabbath, the sepulchre was sealed with a great stone. Now, two days later, that's where our text finds us, two days later, early on that Sunday morning, the three Marys, together with Joanna and the other women, have come to minister to Jesus' body in preparation for his burial. And it's then that the angel breaks the astounding news to these women that Jesus had risen from the dead. You see, Jesus of Nazareth, he says, which was crucified, he is risen. He is not here. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There, there shall you see him as he said unto you, and the women did as they were directed. They went and told the other disciples that Jesus was risen from the dead. Imagine the thoughts that would have flooded the minds of the disciples when these women came and delivered that message to them. No doubt the women would have done exactly as they were instructed. They had told the disciples and in particular they had informed Peter that Jesus goes before you into Galilee. That message would have been almost unbelievable. Indeed, as we read in Mark, uh, Mark's account, uh, the disciples at first did not believe what the women actually told them. Uh, they doubted uh, the word of the women. But when that message was eventually accepted by the disciples, it was a message of enormous joy uh, among them. But imagine for a moment the particular effect that that message would have had upon Peter. It would have in all likelihood have evoked a range of emotions in Peter. There's no doubt that it would have raised in his mind, a painful memory of his threefold denial. It was also a message that would have touched his heart and spoken of Jesus' tender love and concern for him. Before Peter had even heard that message, we know from the scriptures that Peter had been deeply grieved by what he had done. For the previous two days, Peter had been grappling with the enormity of his sins. He knew that he denied his Lord and Saviour. And even to him, it seemed almost unbelievable that he'd actually done that. But he knew that he had done that With the words of his third denial having only just passed from his lips, uh, he heard and he knew uh, what that awful sound of the cock crowing meant. In that moment, he knew. He knew what he had done. We read in Mark 14, 72, and the second time the cock crew, and then we notice this, and Peter called to mind, Peter called to mind, the word that Jesus said unto him before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. What an awful realisation. Sometimes we have that experience in life, I think sometimes too, where we're busily doing things and engaging in different activities and then suddenly we realise the implication and the import of what we have done or said. And that was certainly the case here with Peter. Peter could not escape the enormity of what he had done. He, he understood something of the gravity of his sin. And then not only did he understand that as he recalled those things to mind, 
If you pay attention, careful attention to the gospel accounts, you'll know also that there was that look that he actually received from the Lord himself. After the cock crowed the second time, in the Gospel of Luke we're informed that Jesus actually saw Peter in the courtyard below and their eyes met. We read in Luke 22, 60 through 62, the Lord turned and looked upon Peter and Peter remembered the word of the Lord how he had said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. Just imagine what that look meant for Peter. The look of Jesus and the significance of that look was not lost on him. That look was like a knife through Peter's guilty heart. And the result, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. Such anguish of heart. The memory of his unmitigated betrayal, the cringing realisation of what he had done and the stinging reminder of his own self-confidence. There was nowhere for Peter to hide. There was no escaping what he had done. And then later that very same day, the one that he denies is crucified, seemingly gone forever, the opportunity for reconciliation. So that all that Peter was left with were the memories of his boasting and his denials. What is evident from our text is that in the midst of Peter's anguish and turmoil, as well as the uncertainty and confusion that existed among the other disciples, Jesus did not lose sight of any of them. In particular, he did not lose sight of Peter and of his needs. Peter may have been full of self-confidence and he may have denied Jesus three times. And the truth is that Jesus would have been justified in casting Peter to the wind. But no, despite Peter's unfaithfulness, Jesus still maintained his love and care for Peter. Peter was a great sinner but Jesus was even a greater saviour. He was and is the saviour of great sinners, great sinners such as Peter. Go your way. Tell my disciples and Peter. My disciples must know that I go before them into Galilee. My disciples must know What I told them has come to pass. My disciples must know that I am risen from the dead. That was essential. His disciples' fears, their doubts, their anxieties needed to be relieved. They needed to be comforted. But not only must his disciples as a body know of his resurrection, but Peter, Peter in particular, Peter must know that Jesus was risen from the dead. Yes, tell my disciples, but make sure that you also tell Peter that I am risen and that I go before him into Galilee and there shall he see me as I said unto him. What what a message. What a message for Peter. This message crafted by Jesus was designed to communicate to the disciples but also to Peter Jesus' love and concern for them. 
his disciples were upon his heart. And it would seem that perhaps even nearly the first thing, if not the first thing, uh, that Jesus did following his resurrection from the dead uh, was that he made these arrangements concerning his disciples. His disciples were upon his heart. Peter, the great sinner, was also upon his heart. So that in the midst of Peter's personal grief and his anguish and his self-loathing, Jesus reaches out to him. And he does so in a very personal way. Peter, through his self-confidence and denials, in a certain sense, had excluded himself from the circle of the disciples. He had denied not only Jesus, but in doing so, he had turned his back upon his discipleship. And he'd done that not once, but three times. And he'd even declared that under oath. He denied any knowledge of Jesus and declared emphatically and with increasing vehemence that he was not one of his disciples. Could there be forgiveness for Peter? Was there a way back uh, for him? And the answer was yes. Yes. That's the import of the message that Jesus conveys to him. Tell my disciples and Peter, tell Peter I have not forgotten him. Tell Peter that there is forgiveness with me. I am the compassionate saviour, the saviour of great sinners. Tell that to Peter, tell that to every sinner, even the greatest of sinners. And that, brethren, is what Jesus Christ says to you and I this morning. I am the saviour of sinners. Yes, even great, great sinners. You see, Jesus knew that if he had not referred to Peter by name, that in all likelihood Peter would have concluded that the message was for the other disciples but not for him. After all, he had rejected uh, Jesus. He rejected his discipleship. He distanced himself from Jesus. But the Lord would have Peter know that he was actually dear to him. Peter must know that despite all that he'd done, despite all that he'd done, all in fact was well. Peter must know, as the other disciples, that he had risen from the dead. And so he says here, don't forget to tell Peter. Assure Peter of my love and my concern. It's worth noting, brethren, that uh, Jesus' love for Peter here, of course, was not dependent uh, clearly upon Peter's love or faithfulness. Uh, nothing is uh, clearer, is it, that uh, the Lord's love for Peter was not dependent upon Peter's faithfulness. Nor, thankfully, is his love and care of you and me dependent upon our love or our faithfulness to him. If that were so, neither Peter nor we would ever be saved. The reality was Peter's salvation was all of grace. The truth is our salvation is all of grace. We do not merit it. We cannot earn it. Jesus Christ is a gracious saviour. He bestows his love and grace according to his sovereign determination. He bestows his love and grace upon sinners. Yes, even great sinners. Indeed, the greatest of sinners. The beauty of his grace and love is that they endure notwithstanding our, our unfaithfulness and lack of love for him. Brethren, the truth is we're like Peter. Uh, we repeatedly deny the Lord. And we do that in a myriad of ways. Perhaps it is we don't use the words that Peter employed. Uh, but the truth is we do not always fearlessly confess before men our love for Jesus Christ. Men blaspheme his name. They besmirch his character. Uh, how often is it that we remain mute? At times we, like Peter, also reject him. We live as though he does not exist and as though he is nothing 
uh, to us. At times we stand afar off from him and we effectively say, I know not the man. Peter needed to hear this message, so too do we. Our sins are great, they're numerous, they're blatant, they're indefensible. The truth is we are unfaithful in many instances and we make ourselves unworthy to be called the disciples of Jesus Christ. And sometimes I think it is true, brethren, we have a sense of that. We have a sense of our unworthiness. And so that with poor we cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The child of God experiences that. It's then that we need to remind ourselves of the words and the import of our text. Tell my disciples and Peter. We need to remind ourselves and to rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ is the gracious saviour of sinners. He came into the world, sinners to save. Sinners like Peter, sinners like you and me. This is the good news, the extraordinary news of the gospel. Tell Peter of that news. Tell Peter that I am risen. Tell Peter that I love and care for him. Brethren, this is Jesus Christ's message to all who trust in him. It's his message even to those believers who fall far short of the disciples that they ought to be. This message of Jesus was a genuine word of comfort to Peter. Tell them, I go before them into Galilee, there they shall see me. And what he's saying by that is tell them that I'm alive. Of course, the disciples, as you recall, following the death of Jesus Christ, were absolutely dismayed. Uh, many of them had no conception that Jesus was in fact going to lay down his life and death, even though he told them that he would. And so for them then to hear this, uh, he's not dead but alive, uh, that, that would have been news that would be, was beyond their ability to grasp and comprehend. Tell them that I've risen from the dead. Tell them that neither death nor the grave could hold me. Tell them that I've conquered death and the grave. Tell them that they shall see me, uh, not just see me as an apparition, but they shall see me bodily. They shall have proof that I am alive. Brethren, that's also a message that we need to take hold of and to absorb today. Our Saviour is alive. He's not lying in a sepulchre, a dusty sepulchre in Palestine. His remains are not in Joseph's uh, sepulchre. But he's alive. Do you notice how the uh, Gospel of Mark actually ends? It tells us, in fact, that he is actually uh, ascended into glory and he's ascended to the right hand of his father. And that's where he is even today. That's where he is now. He's alive. And there at the right hand of his father, he makes intercession for us. And because he lives, we shall live also. Peter needed to know that. There's something beautiful about the scriptures too and the completeness of the accounts that the scripture gives. Uh, Peter actually, later that same day, actually saw Jesus. Jesus appeared to Peter. You recall the account in Luke 24 of the uh, men 
on the road to Emmaus uh, where Jesus uh, walked with them and inquired of them as to why uh, they were sad. And then after he had uh, disclosed uh, who he was and revealed to them the fact that he had risen from the dead, we read in Luke 24, 33, 34, And they arose up the same hour, that's these two men from Emmaus, and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. The Lord had appeared to Peter. What a day. What a day. What a saviour. Amen. Let's uh, stand uh, for a brief word of prayer. Lord, we marvel at the uh, care that Jesus Christ uh, uh, took of even that uh, wayward disciple, Peter. Uh, Left to ourselves, we would probably cast off one uh, who denied us and who disowned us. But our Saviour was is a gracious Saviour. And we are thankful that he is a gracious Saviour. Uh, because not only does he deal that way with Peter, uh, but he deals also by his grace with us that way. He cares for us even despite our unfaithfulness. And so our prayer, Lord, is that as we uh, come even today to the uh, sacrament of the Lord's Supper, that you might speak to our hearts of the need that we each have of that Saviour. Uh, we will never enter into uh, glory. We will never know the beauty of heaven apart from the fact that we have a living faith in Jesus Christ. But let us also know that that uh, Saviour is a gracious Saviour. And despite the enormity of our sins, and our sins may truly be great, indeed the truth is all of our sins are great. Uh, we have a uh, tendency to minimise our sins, but the reality is our sins uh, truly are great. But Jesus Christ is a greater Saviour, and he is able and indeed he does, uh, save even the greatest of sinners. Well, may this word uh, be an encouragement uh, to our hearts this day, and this we pray for our Saviour's sake. Amen. Brethren, we're going to uh, proceed now to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I want to take the uh, reading the words of institution out of Matthew 